My name is Dan Paraka. I'm coordinating the year of program. And um, I hope a lot of you got to attend the uh, wonderful concert we had last night at Bailey Performance Hall with uh, music from Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky and uh, Leodov, uh, which was quite nice. Um, we'll have a couple more concerts coming through in the, as the year progresses. Um, I wanted to mention that um, we do not have a talk next week. So it's our one week off um, of, of the weekly lecture series. Um, and so uh, we'll see you in two weeks, I suppose, uh, for those of you who are coming each week. Um, also, we'll mention that on October 19th, we have a special program on a Wednesday. So we will have the regular Thursday series that week. We have a talk on the 20th of October. But on the 19th of October, we'll have a special program with the featuring the Atlanta Balalaika Society uh, um, as, as sort of a kickoff uh, in the middle of the day on Wednesday, uh, with, hopefully with some good uh, food as well as, as music and dance. Our speaker today, uh, Eve Levin, is professor and chair of the history department at the University of Kansas. Um, she received her PhD from Indiana University in 1983 and taught at Ohio State University for 20 years um, prior to uh, going to the University of Kansas. And her specialization lies in the area of Russian and East European history of the, pre, of the pre modern period, in particular uh, gender, sexuality, religion, and medicine. Um, she published her first book, Sex and Society in the World of the Orthodox Slavs, uh, 900 to 1700, uh, in 1989. And her second uh, book, in Ru which was published in Russian, on popular Christianity in 2004. Uh, and since 1996, she, served, she has served as the editor of the Russian Review, which is the uh, oldest uh, still functioning academic journal of Russian studies uh, in the United States. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Levin to Kennesaw State, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. In the Soviet era, a joke circulated. Russia is a country with an uncertain past. The reference was to the repeated falsifications of history, particularly those that occurred in the Soviet period. For example, let's see if this is going to work. Huh. Yes, OK. Leon Trotsky went from being characterized as a leader of the Russian Revolution, <laughs> you see him there, to being literally erased from the pages of history. We in the West can chuckle smugly at such drastic rewritings of history. It couldn't happen here. But the old Soviet joke has more than a kernel of truth. The past is always and everywhere uncertain. Even more, as professional historians understand, History is not some eternal truth with a capital T, a sort of a platonic ideal written on scrolls in pristine, changeless form. Instead, we historians construct history from the varied stories in our sources, bringing to it the concerns and insights of our own time. In that way, the uncertainty of the past is a necessary function of proper historical writing. In every time and place, people are tempted to find the lessons in the past that suit their current agendas. Historians call this a usable past. A usable past has some basis in fact, but the facts are selected because they substantiate conclusions that are appealing to the authors. For a familiar example, depending upon whose version of early American history you read, the Founding Fathers were either secularists wary of institutional religion, or they were devout Christians. Both of those are usable pasts. 
The same phenomenon occurs in the construction of Russian history. Authors repeatedly created stories about the Russian past that suited their, the needs of their time. Today, I'm going to select a few of those episodes, describe the situations that led people, past and present, to embrace these various usable pasts. And I would like to present to you a more accurate version of the history of medieval Russia. First, a note on the time period. For me, medieval Russia stretches from about the year 800 to about the year 1700. And the only justification I could give for that is because that's the parameters of the course I teach at the University of Kansas. <laughs> the geographical location of Russia changed dramatically over this period from the bright green area, more or less. I think that's not really this part right here. I don't think that's a very accurate map right there. Um, in the 11th century to the gray-green area over here in the 16th century to the olive-green area in the 17th century. Okay, myth number one, the Varangian origin of Rus. The oldest story in the history of Russia has generated some of the most memorable usable pasts. It is contained in the first formal written history of Russia, which historians in writing in English usually call the primary chronicle. The chronicle was composed in the mid 11th century, but this particular story occurred in the mid 9th century, that is about 200 years earlier. The chronicle account is surprisingly imprecise. They began to rule themselves, and there was no law among them. But clan rose up against clan, and they engaged in murder and warfare against each other. They said to themselves, we will seek a prince for ourselves who will rule us and judge us according to the law. They went across the sea to the Varangians, the Rus, which is what these Varangians called themselves, just as others call themselves Swedes, others Normans, English, others Goths, so these are called Rus. The Chud, Slavs, and Krivici said, all of our land is great and rich, but there is no order in it. Come and be prince and rule us. So, who were they? Apparently, the residents of what became known as, as the Russian land, tribes of Finnic, Slavic, and Baltic ethnicity. And who were the Varangian Rus? Did they indeed come into a lawless land and bring order? Since the mid-18th century, scholars have debated this question. They were Scandinavians. No, they were Slavs. <laughs> Each side parsed the text. Each side garnered evidence from archaeology, linguistics, and a handful of Russian sources. The point was not moot. If the Slavs needed help from more advanced Germanic leaders in order to establish a functioning state, that reinforced the notion that Russia in all periods should look to the West for tutelage. It's not surprising that this view, the so-called Normanist view, dominated the in the, historio in the historiography of Russia in the United States. Yet one of the founders of the field of Russian history in the United States, Nicholas Razanovsky, dissented from this view. His textbook, A History of Russia, which has been used for generations at American universities, I think it was first published in 1963, mm -hmm. and it's still in print. But it, it embraces the anti-Normanist position. It's not surprising that Ryazanovsky, the son of Russian emigres who fled the revolution, adopted a patriotic position in regard to the Russians being able to found their own state. But even more, as a young scholar in the late 1940s, he was anxious to refute the Normanist position because it dovetailed so disquietingly with Nazi ideology. The scholars who debated the Normanist question 
constructing their own versions of a usable past, rarely noticed that the primary chronicle itself had constructed this story as a usable past. In the middle 11th century, when the chronicle account was written, a Scandinavian ancestry for the princely line would appeal to the royal court in Kiev. Grand Prince Yaroslav's wife was a Swedish princess. His son-in-law was King Harald Hadrada of Norway. Yaroslav himself was trying to bring law and order, codifying Russia's first law code, um, Ruskaya Pravda, and he was trying to bring rebellious princes under his authority and establish rule over diverse tribes. However, a less salutary picture of the original Rus emerges from reading between the lines of the Chronicle. The Rus were less princes with retinues than they were mafiosos with bands of enforcers. They went into the settlements and demanded payments from the inhabitants so they wouldn't get hurt. That wasn't government. That was a protection racket. <laughs> and to judge for the names of the Rus, such as were recorded in the sources, they were a multi-ethnic bunch. Myth number two, the conversion of Rus. According to the primary chronicle, Grand Prince Vladimir, the father of Yaroslav, chose Orthodox Christianity as the official religion of Rus in 988. The Chronicle describes multiple stages in leading up to this event. In fact, the Chronicle as a whole places Russian history in the context of Christian history, beginning its story with Noah and the Flood. The Rus are depicted as the new Israel, the people through whom God's will is manifested in the world. Events have supernatural meanings. Famines, floods, fires are punishment for sins. Evildoers are taught by the devil. And persons who protect the true faith are blessed by God. The Chronicles version of history, then, is a spiritual allegory rather than a dispassionate narration of events, their causes, and consequences. The Chronicler composed his account for, of the conversion of the Rus more than half a century after the events. While there were still people alive who had lived through them as young children, radically different stories were already circulating. This is the version the Chronicler chose. He recounted the precedents. The Apostle Andrew, he wrote, had visited the land of Rus. Okay. <laughs> More recently, Vladimir's grandmother, Olga, had traveled to Constantinople and been baptized there. But Vladimir's father, Sviatoslav, had refused baptism. Vladimir did not readily turn to the faith of his grandmother either. Instead, first, about 980, he set up a unified pagan pantheon. I think you can see that. This is a later rendering, of course, but you can see it there. So he set up this unified pagan pantheon in Kiev. And this pantheon, though you can't see it in this illustration, had eight deities, six male, one dog, and one female in last place after the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so much for the idea that paganism was feminist. <laughs> but just a few years later, he invited representatives of four faith traditions, Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism to debate their faiths. Although the Chronicle depicts, depicts the Orthodox representative as the clear winner of this debate, Vladimir did not decide in its favor at that point. Instead, he sent ambassadors to investigate the three faiths in situ, German Catholicism, Islam and its vulgar Bulgar variety, and Greek Orthodoxy. According to the Chronicle, 
the embassy returned with a clear consensus in favor of orthodoxy. We knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, they said of the liturgy they attended in the magnificent cathedral of St. Sophia in Constantinople. But still Vladimir demurred according to the chronicle. Instead, he traveled to Crimea, where he captured the Greek commercial town of Kherson. And if you follow the arrows, that's about where you're looking at. He then sent to the Byzantine co-emperors saying that he would return the town to them in exchange for the emperor's sister as a bride. The emperors agreed with the proviso that Vladimir convert to Christianity. He did and then returned to Kiev issuing an order that everyone go to the river and be baptized. How much of this story could be confirmed? Actually, very little. Olga actually did travel to Constantinople and became a Christian. Vladimir did set up a pagan ritual site. The religious debate is iffier. A suspiciously similar scene occurred in a story about the conversion of the Khazars, the neighbors of Rus on the European steppe. Except the Khazars ended up choosing Judaism instead of Christianity. Perhaps Vladimir did solicit a report on Byzantine Christianity. Rus merchants visited Constantinople and could attend a service in Hagia Sophia. Vladimir did ca capture Kherson, although he returned it to Byzantine rule, establishing no lasting presence there. And he did marry the Byzantine princess Anna. The chronicler rejected other versions of history known to him. One involved Vladimir converted to Christianity in Kiev, another in Vasilkov, and in still other places. <coughs> Kiev is actually plausible. If Vladimir's goal was to convert the people of Rus, and not just himself, it would make sense for him to model baptism in his capital city. But by placing the conversion in Byzantine territory, the chronicler tied Vladimir and by extension the Russian church to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. <coughs> and in doing so, the chronicler advanced an agenda of his own time, the mid 11th century. In 1054, the growing rift between the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch in Constantinople resulted in a permanent schism. So it suited the chronicler to depict the German and Greek forms of Christianity as entirely separate and different, and to align Rus firmly on the side of Eastern Orthodoxy. He created a version of the history of the 980s that suited the church and the Rus state in the 1050s. Later scholars reading the Primary Chronicle similarly found usable pasts in their interpretation of the conversion account. For example, Russian Orthodox ecclesiastical scholars of the 19th century invoked it to substantiate their contention that Crimea was properly Orthodox and Russian. At that time, Crimea had recently been incorporated into the Russian Empire, and its population was primarily Tatar and Muslim. However, the primary chronicles version permitted the characterization of Crimea as historically Russian. Just last fall, Vladimir Putin invoked a similar reading of history in order to justify Russia's annexation of Crimea. He said, it was in Crimea that Grand Prince Vladimir was baptized before bringing Christianity to Rus. And he continued, all of this allows us to say that Crimea has invaluable civilizational and even sacral importance for Russia like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem for the followers of Islam and Judaism. But this claim backfired on Putin because Ukraine and Russia share the same early history. And because Grand Prince Vladimir made his capital in Kiev rather than in Moscow, which did not yet exist in the 10th century, Ukraine arguably had a greater historical claim to Crimea than Russia did. 
another aspect of the conversion story in the primary chronicle also served as the basis for a variety of usable pasts. The chronicle reports that the baptism of the people of Rus occurred upon Vladimir's orders. Obedience to the Grand Prince, rather than genuine faith in Christ, motivated the conversion. The inclusion in later chronicle entries of several episodes describing continuing pagan activity seemed to later scholars to confirm that Christianity did not take hold quickly. This view was attractive to many intellectuals of the 19th century, whether they considered themselves to be westernizers, that is, in favor of making Russia more like the West, or they considered themselves to be Slavophiles, that is, in favor of making Russia truer to its own roots. Both groups were concerned about the status of the peasantry of their own day. They regarded, they regarded the peasants as ignorant and superstitious, and they described the peasants' religious system as voyeviria, dual faith, a pagan and Christian duality. Westernizers, who tended to be non-religious, happily identified folk belief and custom as pagan. Marxist revolutionaries took this a step further. They liked to imagine that the peasants resisted Christianity as an oppressive ideology imposed by the state. The Slavophiles, who tended to identify as Orthodox Christians, decried peasants' ignorance while applauding their simple faith. They called for the education of peasants in Orthodoxy as an antidote to the attraction of revolutionary ideas. These views of medieval Rus religion, based more in 19th century debates than in actual evidence, have become so entrenched that few people, even scholars, have challenged them. But I'm one who has. A careful reading of the Primary Chronicle demonstrates that the so-called pagan leaders were usually not ethnic Russians. Instead, they came from the Finnic peoples among whom the, Slav the ethnic Slavs lived. And this map here is sort of misleading. It makes it look like the, the tribes are all, you know, sort of in these bl colored blocks. But in fact, they're living intermixed with each other. And you should think of the blocks actually as being just where there, there was more of those of the people of that particular ethnicity rather than all people of that ethnicity and no one else. Anyway, most of the non-Slavic peoples had a really strained relationship with the Rus. The Rus princes and their retinues continued to collect tribute from the Finnic people in the same mafia manner as in the past and Finnic peoples often resisted. Despite occasional conversion efforts, some of the non-Slavic peoples of European Russia never became Christian, even to this day. Meanwhile, Christianity spread quite quickly among the Slavic population. By the 12th century, Christianity had taken root in villages in the remote regions of European Russia, as archeological finds of crosses and graves have, can demonstrate. While lived orthodoxy in medieval Russia incorporated many symbols, rituals, and beliefs of pagan origin, that was typical of Christianity in general. And if you think about it, if all pagan elements were removed from Christianity, the remainder would be Judaism of the first century. <laughs> Christianity became so central to the self-identification of ordinary ethnic Russians that the word for peasant in Russian is Christianin, that is literally Christian. And this is a word that in medieval documents peasants are using for themselves. Myth number three, the Mongol conquest. You can't give a talk on medieval Russia without Mongols, blood and gore. In the Western imagination, Russia is defined by the Mongol conquest. I heard the adage, scratch a Russian, find a Tatar, long before I became a professional historian. Russia's Mongol genealogy became a convenient explanation for everything bad, backwardness, 
brutality, tyranny, it's all the fault of the Mongols. Russians today also tend to accept the evil Mongol mythology. The Tatars supposedly introduced an autocratic and tyrannical form of government and taught Russians to be subservient to us. The mid-19th century Russian thinker Pyotr Chadayev, who inspired the westernizer mover, movement, decried the Mongols as a foreign, savage, and degrading domination of the spirit which was later inherited by the national power, that is, the Russian government of his day. In addition, the Mongols cut Russia off from the West, so preventing Russia from experiencing the revival of Western civilization in the Renaissance. One of my college professors, a Russian emigre, told me that Russians had never used mother swears until the foul-mouthed Tatars introduced them. <laughs> and so, the Russian intelligentsia absorbed racist Western attitudes about Asian peoples. Most of the mythology of the Mongol legacy in Russia is just wrong. The Mongols did not colonize Russia, so Russians are not, by and large, genetically Asian. Later on, in the 16th and 17th centuries, some Tatars did convert to Russian Orthodoxy and assimilate into the Russian population. Perhaps Chadayev's ancestor was among them. His family name comes from the Mongol Chagatai, something I think he didn't know. <laughs> Instead, the Mongols were absentee rulers, governing Russia through Russian princes and existing law. While certain aspects of later Russian government structure were based on Mongol models, because they worked well, the idea of autocracy came from Byzantium. While ruling Russia, the Mongols did not cut Russia off from the West. On the contrary, they countersigned trade treaties concluded with Baltic cities. Why? Because the Mongols wanted to collect tribute from Russia in silver, and the territory of Russia at that time had no silver mines. Russians acquired silver through foreign trade, and the Baltic region was the major commercial partner. The Mongols did not cause a decline in morality or influence Russian social norms in any appreciable way. They gave the Russian Orthodox Church a tax exemption, and so its influence greatly expanded during the Mongol period. And despite what my professor told me, the Mongols did not introduce mother swears. I found references to them in texts written prior to 1240. <coughs> a second mythology in regard to the Mongols in Russia alert, uh, emerged in the early 20th century, Eurasianism. In the first incarnation of Eurasianism, in the 1920s, Russian intellectuals in exile formulated the theory that the Mongol conquest, brutal as it was, positioned Russia uniquely to bring European civilization to Asia. That theory was condescending to Asians, of course, but it was not unlike European colonialism of that period. More recent versions of Eurasianism are not so benign. Instead, they enunciate notions of Russian superiority, both to Asians and to Western Europeans. Turning now to old Russian accounts of Mongol rule, they promoted a different usable past. Chroniclers continued the practice of interpreting events as unfolding sacred history of God's relationship with this new Israel of Russia. The chroniclers attributed Mongol, the Mongol invasion to God's punishment for sin. And the chief sin that they highlighted was civil wars among the princes of Rus. Civil war was common in pre-Mongol Rus. The princes battled each other for control of the major seats of power, Kiev, Novgorod, Chernigov, and from the 12th century on, the newer towns toward the northeast, especially Vladimir, which had become the capital. 
The chroniclers decried violence among the princes and also their habit of recruiting allies from among the steppe nomads, the Polovtse. The nomads were not Christian, which automatically set them up in the chronicler's view for disapproval. When the Russians had sinned, God allowed the nomads to raid Rus towns. Russian princes, as the result of the devil's instigation, helped the steppe nomads to do so. Thus, at the, at the first appearance of the Mongols in 1223, the chronicler fitted this new steppe people into the old paradigm. The account of the battle on the river Kalka, written shortly afterwards, told of this first contact. The Mongols demanded that the Polovtsi of the steppe submit to them. But the Polovtsi and Prince Kotyak instead called in reinforcements in the person of his son-in-law, Prince Mstislav of Kiev. The Russian force came out of out to the steppe, brash and overconfident, and they were soundly defeated. When the Mongols returned a decade and a half later, the chroniclers again turned to the old explanations. The invasion was punishment for Russian sins, particularly the sin of the prince's infighting. The chroniclers never acknowledged conquest, only repeated invasions. The chroniclers invoked the same paradigm to explain the liberation from Mongol rule. The Russian princes unified and God blessed them. The text composed to recount the Russian victory at the Battle of Kulikova in 1380 are filled with this mythology. But it was more propaganda than reality. Some Russian princes just did not show up and it was another century and a half before the Russian state was fully unified. Nor did Kulikova constitute liberation from Mongol rule. It was a victory only in one battle over a Mongol renegade rather than a legitimate Khan. Mongol rule continued until 1480, a whole century later. But the official version of events heightened the stature of the princes of Moscow in their drive to lead the consolidation of Russian principalities under their control. Scholars have often accepted a secularized version of this narrative. But for the Russian prince's disunity, Russia could have escaped Mongol conquest, and unif unification was the key to liberation. But no, the Mongol army was militarily superior to everyone in the world. It had conquered Central Asia, China, Persia, <coughs> the Russians were not going to escape. And it was not un Russian unification that led to independence, but rather Mongol disunification. However, given in the account of the battle on the river Kalka is a hint about it, an alternative path that history could have taken. On the eve of the battle, Mongol ambassadors visited the Russian camp. They said, we have not attacked you and we have not seized anything of yours, but we have attacked our slaves, the Polovtse, for from long ago the Polovtse were our horse grooms. So why do you bring war and bloodshed upon us? If you want to be well, make peace with us and cast out the Polovtse. Instead of accepting that offer, the Russians murdered the Mongol ambassadors. Perhaps that was the single mistake that led to the Mongol conquest. Myth four, Novgorod as Russia's democratic alternative. The city of Novgorod, located in Northwest Russia, has generated more than its share of mythology. It was Russia's primary location for commerce with Western Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Unlike other towns of Kiev and Rus, it did not have its own line of princes. Instead, the Grand Prince of Kiev appointed, 
appointed his representative, often his son, to govern there. In the absence of an ensconced princely family, the local elites gained power. During the 12th century, Novgorod developed the custom of inviting a Russian prince from another town and having him sign a contract to provide military protection. Archbishops, too, were chosen locally, and then they were sent to the highest official of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Metropolitan, for confirmation. This situation lasted until 1471, when Grand Prince Ivan III of Moscow, hearing that Novgorod had contracted with a Lithuanian prince rather than with a Russian, brought an army. The Novgorodian militia was no match for the Muscovite force, and Novgorod was forcibly incorporated into the centralizing Russian state based in Moscow. To westernizer intellectuals in the 19th century and their heirs in the West, Novgorod represented Russia's lost alternative to Muscovite autocracy. Calling Novgorod the Republic of St. Sophia after the city's main cathedral in a form of terminology modeled on the designation of Italian city-states, Westernizers pondered how different Russia would have been if Novgorod, rather than Moscow, had become the center of the Russian state, emerging from Mongol rule in the 15th century. So they projected onto medieval Novgorod the characteristics that they hoped to create in the Russia of their own day. And what did this imaginary Novgorod look like? Well, first, it was open to Western influences, welcoming to foreigners. Its economy was based on business rather than agriculture, so it represented economic development. It escaped Mongol rule, so that degrading experience never marred it. Most of all, however, it was democratic. It was a republic governed by an elected mayor. The city assembly, called a Vietje, consisted of all free male citizens. When threatened with tyranny, the Novgorodian Vietje rose up to quash it, unseating mayors and showing power-hungry princes the road out of town. And in a nod to women's rights, which was a major issue in, in 19th century Russia, Novgorod even had a woman mayor, Marfa Boretskaya, who bravely stood up to Grand Prince Ivan III, defiant to the end. But the narrow-minded Muscovites shut off trade with the West, confiscated Novgorod's wealth, deported its leading citizens to the East. It closed down the Vietje and terminated the post of mayor. Russia's first window on the West was slammed shut. What an inspiring picture. And what an attractive, usable past. So attractive that scholars, even to, to this day, continue to invoke it. Not so long ago, when a prominent political scientist was asked whether there was any hope for liberalization in Russia today, she pointed to Novgorod. At a conference of scholars of Novgorod that I attended in the year 2011, we all agreed that the word republic was a misnomer. Neither it nor any word with any sort of analogous meaning appears in any document coming from medieval Novgorod. But even so, many of us at that conference continued to use the word republic. Unfortunately, most of the elements of this usable past don't turn out to be true. Certainly, Novgorod had extensive contact with the West. But while there is evidence of cross-fertilization, in the technology of bell making, for example, it did not extend to the realm of ideas. Instead, Novgorod's culture was virtually indistinguishable from that in other parts of the Rus lands. While Novgorod's wealth came from commerce, its chief product was furs, acquired from non-Slavic peoples in the same way as the ancient Varangian Rus, that is, mafia-style coercive exploitation. Novgorod was as subject to Mongol rule as other Russian territories. It escaped devastation in the initial invasion by surrendering. As for the famous Novgorod assembly, the Vietje, the word meant a meeting rather than a formal legislative body. 
No document anywhere, and I've read them all, stated that all free male citizens had the right to vote at the Vietje. Indeed, there is no evidence that the Vietje conducted votes at all. Novgorodians did indeed dismiss princes who failed to please. For example, in 1270, the Novgorodians told a prince whose name was Yaroslav to leave, but he objected, and he even solicited Mond Mongol assistance. The Mongols actually refused to get involved. Novgorod remained defiant, telling Yaroslav, we have no prince here, but we have God and truth and Saint Sophia, and we don't want you. But in the end, they took him back under duress from him and from the Russian Orthodox Church. Novgorodians also dismissed mayors who failed to satisfy by staging riots, burning down houses. You can see <coughs> those little lines there are the flames. And throwing goods and sometimes um, mayors into the river. That's democracy at its most democratic form. As for women, I work on women. I've concluded reluctantly that there never was a woman who held the office of mayor. The document that says so is a later, is a later forgery. It made me sad. But Marfa Boretskaya was the wealthiest person in Novgorod in the 1460s and immensely influential. She spoke at a Vietje meeting, <coughs> and she was not the first woman to do so. Women and even children regularly attended ceremonial gatherings, such as the investiture of a new bishop or the reception of a new prince. A woman even figured prominently in a gathering in 1418, which turned violent. In that case, one angry man took the son of a rival hostage and while the men dithered, a woman jumped up and, and subdued him. The reality of the incorporation of Novgorod into the Muscovite state similarly proves much more interesting than the myth of suppression. Novgorod under Muscovite rule remained a major commercial center, hampered not by policy so much as by technological reality. The larger seafaring ships of the late 15th century could not sail so far upstream. It remained politically important too, so much so that Ivan the Terrible suspected the city of treason. It was there in 1570 that he engaged in one of his most famous acts of brutality. Myth five, Ivan the Terrible. You can't have a lecture on medieval Russia without Ivan the Terrible. Tsar Ivan IV has arguably been the center of more myth-making than any other Russian ruler. Most Americans have heard of him. How many of you have heard of him? Yay, yeah. Although, they usually have no idea what was so terrible about him. He reigned for more than 50 years, having come to the throne in 1533 at the age of three. He was heir to generations of state building and consolidation of power in Moscow. And he continued these efforts with some spectacular successes and some spectacular failures. The successes included the conquest of the Mongol Khanate of Kazan and expansion of the Russian state down the Volga ri River to the Caspian Sea and east into Western Siberia. The failures included the abortive attempt to gain a seaport on the Baltic Sea, leading to decades of war with Poland and Lithuania. In addition, in 1564, Ivan claimed a large part of the territory of Russia as his private domain, called the Aprichnina, and set up a special police force, also usually called the Aprichnina, to protect him from treason. The result was mass terror the merciless execution of large numbers of people, most of them innocent, as best we can tell. The city of Novgorod was the target of one such operation in 1570. 
But one of Ivan's most memorable violent acts, the murder of his <laughs> eldest son and heir, proves upon closer examination to be untrue. The story comes from a foreign diplomat at the Royal Court of Moscow who claimed to be a witness and has been repeated by historians for centuries. It's the subject of this brilliant painting by the 19th century artist Ilya Repin, depicting the distraught Ivan cradling his dying son and contemplating the destruction of his realm that his outburst of anger caused. Yet, according to Yale historian Paul Bushkovich, who recently investigated this legend, the diplomat was not present at the court at the time and neither were any of his informants. He apparently just made the story up because no other source of information says anything similar. Russian thinkers of recent centuries have freely spun myths around Ivan the Terrible, both positive and negative. They laud his state building and his larger than life persona. At the same time as paranoia about treason is a tragic flaw, undermining everything he tried to accomplish. In the era of Stalin, discussion of Ivan the Terrible became a veiled way of talking about Stalin himself. The great filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein produced an epic movie biography of, of Ivan. I understand those of you who are studying with Professor Vladimirov know about this film. In part one, here on the left, we see the successful Ivan. In part two, he morphs into the ineffective ruler suspicious of everyone. Stalin liked part one, he did not like part two, and part three never got made. <laughs> In Russia today, Ivan was, is once again admired. There's even been talk of canonizing him as a Russian Orthodox saint. This is particularly per peculiar because Ivan deposed and then murdered the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Metropolitan Philip, because Philip had dared to reproach him as a tyrant. For many people, both in Russia and the West, Ivan the Terrible is the epitome of the typical Russian ruler, autocratic and erratic. It's not surprising that the media <laughs> have now derided Vladimir Putin in headlines as Putin the Terrible. However, Ivan's nickname Grozny does not have the same negative connotation as our word terrible. Grozny means something closer to awe-inspiring or even awesome. Russians of Ivan's time did not think badly of him. Folk tales depicted Ivan as a hero he protected peasants against the depredations of the evil nobles, the boyars. Educated Russians, although more aware of Ivan's excesses, did not object to autocracy as a form of government. Instead, they proposed that a good ruler was one who did not attempt to govern autonomously, but who instead heeded the, the guidance of wise advisors. The Romanov dynasty, which ascended to the throne in 1613, followed this model. Tsars Michael and Alexei, while claiming the title of autocrat, consulted extensively with high-ranking churchmen and with the boyar elite. The reality of shared power was manifested in diplomatic ceremonies. You see a depiction of one here, where, they, where the boyar sat with the Tsar around the perimeter of the room. Tsar Alexei once told a foreign diplomat I can make no decision without my boyars. Ironically, it was Peter the Great, the westernizer and modernizer, who dispensed with shared governance. Myth six, westernization in Russia. Most textbooks say it was Peter the Great who initiated the westernization of a stagnant Muscovite Russia. However, 17th century Muscovy was not stagnant, but rather undergoing considerable change, much influenced by contacts with the West. The influx of foreigners into Russia, so characteristic of Peter's reign, <coughs> occurred earlier. Russia had been, in, had been inviting foreign experts for centuries, but the numbers increased dramatically in the mid 17th century under Tsar Michael, Peter's grandfather, Tsar Alexei, his father, and the regent Sophia, his older half-sister. 
In particular, the Muscovite government recruited military advisors who aided with the modernization of the army into a force that, that could defeat European enemies. It also welcomed craftsmen and medical professionals. But the primary conduit of Western influence was, strangely enough, the Russian Orthodox Church. However, Russian historians of the 19th century perceived the Russian Orthodox Church of their own day as reactionary, hostile to progress. So they projected that view onto the church of the 17th century as a way of enunciating contemporary political commentary. Most American textbooks repeat this narrative. So how did the Russian Orthodox Church become the vanguard of westernization in the 17th century? It started with the printing press. Up until that time, Russia primarily relied upon hand-copied books, which diverged considerably one from the others. Standardization of the books would permit better supervision of religious practice within the centralized state. But Muscovy lacked persons knowledgeable about operating a printing press, or even more important, making informed decisions about what to print. So they imported experts, educated clergymen, from Ukrainian and Belarusian areas of Poland-Lithuania. Those churchmen were highly educated in order to defend orthodoxy amidst the multi-religious context of Poland in that day. From this base, the Ukrainians' influence spread. Tsar Alexei chose them to educate his children and to compose and translate texts for use at his court. They also established schools to educate promising Russian churchmen. The Ukrainians brought in not only printing technology, but also other changes in orthodoxy. They introduced hitherto unknown texts, a more realistic style in icon painting, and you see an example there. And Western style polyphonic church music. In keeping with patterns in Western Europe, they re promoted a self-reflective version of Christianity based in belief and an internalized sense of morality rather than in rote practice. Conformity was also important to them. They believed that there was a single right wording for sacred texts, a single proper form of rituals. They valued hierarchy and submission to ecclesiastical authority. The innovations generated opposition as much about the dictatorial manner in which they were imposed as about the content of the changes themselves. But the, formers, the reformers prevailed, backed by the Russian state. By the end of the 17th century, virtually every high ecclesiastical office in Russia was held by a Ukrainian. Russian Orthodox Church leaders today harken back proudly to the 17th century roots. A time, they say, when the church proudly opposed Western decadence and upheld traditional values. They highlight opposition, in particular, to homosexuality. And here I'm going to indulge myself because I wrote a book on sex. But the fact was that the 17th century church was indifferent to homosexuality, which was what, but one of many sexual sins particularly serious one, especially compared with something really serious like premarital sex or the woman on top. <laughs> English travelers to Moscow were astonished at what they saw. George Turberville, who cast his observations in verse, wrote, perhaps the mujik, the peasant, hath a gay and gallant wife. I have to add here, gay in the 17th century English prose does not mean what it means today. Perhaps the mujik hath a gay and gallant wife to serve his beastly lust. Yet he will lead a bugger's life. The monster more desires a boy within his bed than any wench. The modern Russian Orthodox Church's position on homosexuality and family values is rooted in American conservative Christian views 
not 17th century Russian tradition. There was another way, too, in which 17th century Russia paralleled the development of European nation states in empire building. Although many textbooks credit Peter the Great for this, his innovation consisted primarily of the introduction of the word imperia, that is, empire. From the inception of the first Rus state in the 10th century, Russia has been multi-ethnic and multi-religious. The greatest expansion occurred in the 17th century, all the way across Siberia. Peter's additions were relatively small. Some land in modern day Ukraine and the port city on the Baltic that Ivan the Terrible had failed to secure. In European colonial terms, the Russian Empire of the 17th century proved to be the most successful and the most enduring of any of the European empires. Even today, the Russian Federation retains most of the territory contained within the realm of Tsar Alexei and Regent Sophia. You have to have a slide of slate basils. The mythologies created around the history of medieval Russia are many, and they have served to explain supposedly eternal features of Russia. Its ambivalence towards the West, its despotic government, its deep but somewhat peculiar religiosity. But if the search for in the past for evidence to back up these stereotypes, however comforting they may be, has had the effect of obscuring much more revealing stories about the past. When Russian history seems to be too usable for contemporary purposes, that is when we most need to re-examine it. Thank you. Fantastic. So, what is, what is the We end? have plenty of time for questions, so uh, we'll <laughs> open the floor for questions. Yes. We were looking at, um, I guess, Yaroslav secular laws in, in uh, Dr. Pace class, and we've been trying to figure out what agreements were, the fines that were imposed, how much was that as far as the annual income or the 40 Okay, that, that's a, okay, first of all, a grievna is not minted money. It's a bar of silver. Okay. Of, well, more or less the same way. There's actually a change, I think, in the 14th century where they have better um, metal casting techniques and less silver was lost to the slag and then the grievna gets actually better. Um, a grievna and sil there were actually three types of grievnas. There's a silver grievna, which is what's usually intended. There's a gold grievna, which is worth five times as much as a silver grievna. And then there's what they call a grievna kun, which is uh, fur money. They used bundles of fur as money, especially for smaller pur purchases. So I think it was, if my memory, if I recall, um, a silver grievna is the equivalent of 12 furs. So a grief note would be enough money. It's, it's hard to say because we don't really know. We don't have good evidence about prices. But a grief note is enough money that for a person who of modest means, it's almost impossible to put it together. So you could think of it as, you know, I would say, you know, think about trying to come up with $1,500, $2,000. For some people, that's a lot of money and really hard to do. For people who are wealthy, it's not so much money. But one of the things you can do is if you look in this law code, and you look at, you can look at the comparative seriousness of various crimes by looking at <coughs> what the penalties were. Yeah. And you could, in addition to the, the, the Ruska Pravda, which is the secular code, uh, which probably does in its earliest form date to the period of Yaroslav. There's also the church code of Yaroslav, which probably doesn't date to his period, because probably later, which also has monetary fines. But you can think of the two of them as sort of two halves of a whole, with the church code dealing with religious and family law and the 
um, secular code having to do with things having to do with property and public behavior. Okay, I'm, I'm really glad you talked about the first myth about the Varangian roofs being from Scandinavia. Um, I've been reading Viking history, and so it's been talking a lot about how the traders would come down. So is the myth that you're dispelling that they were Scandinavian, or is the myth that they were invited, or both? I think that they, you know, who invite, invites in Vikings, right? <laughs> 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 I think, I, in terms of, certainly there was a Scandinavian presence. That much archaeology absolutely shows. But were the Rus actually Scandinavian? That's more, that's a, a, a more difficult problem. When we have evidence about the ethnicity of the Rus, it's sort of mixed. Because in, one, in some cases, it looks like, if you went, look at their names, a lot of the names seem to be Scandinavian. But some are not. There's a one piece of evidence that actually I think is compelling, and that comes from um, a book written by the Byzantine emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus for his son about how to run the empire. And he talks about those people far to the north, and he talks about the rapids on the Dnieper and how the trade goods would have to come down there, and he names all the rapids on the Dnieper, and he gives the names in two languages. One language which he calls Slavic, actually it's Slavic, but then there's a language that he calls Russian, and that's Scandinavian. So, and that doesn't mean that the Scandinavians are Rus, it just means that Constantine Porphyrogenitus thought they were. Um, but it's a complicated question. I think that the real thing I'm trying to refute is the idea that Scandinavians came in and set up a state because the Russians were incapable of governing themselves. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, slavery in uh, Russian history, is, can you explain the whatever unique qualities there are about it in Russia as opposed to what we know about slavery? Okay. Russian slavery was historically not like the slavery we, in the American South. First of all, the people who were enslaved are not physically different. So it's not a racial thing in Russia. Secondly, it's not a plantation system, which where the slave owners are bringing in a cheap labor force in order to produce cash crops. So it, in that way, it's quite different. There was slavery in Russia, and in fact, multiple levels of people who we would consider to be in some way in bondage. So they're not only slaves, but they're people who are sort of under labor contracts for extended periods. There are people who are serfs who owe rent to landlords, but may be free to leave and go to someplace else if they want. So uh, they're prisoners of war who become slaves as well. They're people who are sold into slavery for their debts. So there's a lot of different types of slavery. But the people who are in the positions of slaves may be of the same ethnicity as the slaveholders. Now, one of the things that's really peculiar about slavery, especially when you get into the 16th century, is there seem to be people who are selling themselves or being sold by their families into slavery who don't have any labor potential. Very old people, for example, or people who are infirm become slaves. And one scholar, um, I think it was Anne Climola who suggested this to me, said that in fact this may be a way of providing charity to somebody. We don't think of slavery as being charitable, but a sl the, the owner had a responsibility for taking it care of slaves. And in fact, that there's a moral responsibility. There even are some um, prohibitions on mistreating slaves in certain ways. For example, raping slaves, although I think it happened often enough, or um, killing slaves. So in that way, Russian slavery was quite different. One of the things Peter the Great did is he abolished slavery. But he didn't abolish slavery in order, out of some sort of humanitarian ideal. 
He abolished slavery because slaves didn't pay taxes, and he wanted them to pay taxes. So they stopped being slaves, they started being serfs, and then they had to pay taxes, which did not help their position in any real way. In addition, in the course of the 18th century, the status of serfs declined to the point that they could be sold separate from land. They could be exiled, and in most cases, except for really blatant things, masters could kill slaves with impunity. So the status of the, I mean the serfs, so the, the status of the serfs really declined <coughs> to something that was much closer to American style chattel slavery. But that happened in the 18th century, not in the medieval period. You talked about the um, Alexei and the Boyers and, and having somewhat of a consultative process. How, how much does that, did that, how long did that last? To, uh, and, and yeah. It lasted until Peter. And I think it was because, for what, we have a lot more information about Peter's character than we do about any of the other rulers. And he seemed to really want to do things his own way and get things done immediately. And he was not interested in, in consulting with boyars. He, he chose some friends who he would um, consult and party with to also. But the, the boyars, who were the traditional members of the elite, were not entirely behind Peter's program. But um, Michael consulted very, very much with the boyars, and particularly he consulted with the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in his day, because his father, who had been forced to take vows as a monk during some of the turmoil that followed the reign of Ivan the Terrible, Michael's father became the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, the patriarch. So it was father and son, biological father and son, who were, had this sort of dual power thing going on. Now, Alexei did not want to have that kind of relationship with his patriarch, Nikon. And in fact, when Nikon demanded that kind of position, um, Alexei told him no, and Nikon walked off the job. But Alexei was very good about uh, consulting with boyars. That said, he arranged to appoint to those position, the positions of boyars, the members of his council, those boyars who he thought were good. He had the choice over who was appointed, and particularly in the 1650s, he started appointing a lot of men who came from <coughs> slightly lower ranking families and raising them up and appointing them there. Um, the Regent Sophia actually had to continue this because as a woman of the imperial family, she, would come, she was supposed to come out in public only under very rare particular circumstances for particular ceremonies. She wasn't supposed to be there to receive foreign dignitaries or reports. So they actually, she was regent for her younger brothers, Ivan V who was um, mentally retarded, and Peter, who was just a young child. And they had this double throne that was built for the two of them, with a space literally behind the throne for Sophia to sit and to tell the boys what they were supposed to be saying to people. So she actually had to work through the, through the existing power structures, and she did very effectively. Um, so effectively that Peter decided when he reached adulthood that he had to get rid of his sister and locked her up in a convent by saying that she was being immodest and in order to be able to dispense with that consultative government. What never happened was having that institutionalized as a parliament or a congress. Is there anything about uh, Britain that you could recommend of works that are out there about contemporary events placed in the context of, of Russian history that you think are good work? Oh dear. I have to say an awful lot of the things about a contemporary events 
just draw on the old mythologies. There aren't too many of them that are written by people like me. Um, I did write, I did publish an article in the journal Critica about the seven, <coughs> about Russia, which is some of the same stuff you heard today. I'd have to think more about that. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, have you, is there any recorded history of pre-modern dealings with um, Russia or Russia in the pre-modern unified uh, country of Korea? Because North Korea and Russia are now yeah. kind of. Um, Russians, the Russian Empire expands out, almost out to that area in the 17th century. But the area which has a large, Korean population, which is in um, the Primoria, in other words, the area uh, south of Vladivostok, so around there. Russia did not actually annex that territory until later on. So it's a 19th century development. So they're not really having a lot of developments with Korea. I think the, the affinities that you find between North Korea and Russia, or particularly Soviet, the Soviet Union, were a result of um, the, Korea, the f first North Korean leader having lived and studied in the Soviet Union in Moscow. So he learned Russian military techniques, Russian tactics, as well as, of course, ideology, and he brought that back. I'm actually taking the little bit I know about Russia and Korea out of the dissertation of um, of one of my students. I was, well, he's not really my student. I was second reader on his dissertation. But he wrote a dissertation about um, the roots of the North Korean army. And the Soviet Union was one of them because of um, Kim's uh, association with, particularly his experience with the Soviet Union. So I think it's a later thing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You're welcome.